hello welcome back it's 2021 oh yes it is welcome to the january edition of bad apple i've come dressed as an apple today a green apple as you can see uh, i also think of this as like my asta jumper it looks like a working asta happy to help um okay so my first guest Oh yeah. Okay, she's a Manchester-based uh, writer, performer, producer. She doesn't say singer, so maybe we'll discuss that when we're talking a little bit. It is the one, the only, it is, it's Keisha Thompson. Keisha, turn on your thing. Welcome to the stage. Yeah. That's my like jazz hands instead of clapping. Oh, <laughs> oh, the cat wants to get in. My cat just say hi. Oh, hi, yeah. Keisha, hi. <laughs> um, our welcome. Um, happy uh -huh. New Year. Happy New Year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. I know, it's just totally um, bonkers, isn't it? <laughs> Crazy times. Okay, I'll, I'll start with my first question then. So I know you kind of mostly as like um, a poet. I would say you're a poet and you're like big on the Manchester scene. Um, why do you write? What does it do for you? Um... I got introduced to writing from quite a young age. Um, it was a space for playfulness. I was encouraged to write stories and yeah, poems and songs from when I was about like five or six. Um, so I kind of just, yeah, I just, I've got very vivid memories of just being in my room and like, playing with my toys but also making these little books and then giving them to my mom and just coming up with little stories so that was just always encouraged and then I just continued and just kept doing it and then realized that I was using it to process things to understand concepts and to communicate ideas to other people eventually. Are, are your family an arty family? No no I'm I mean, my sister was a dancer when I was growing up, but she didn't really pursue that. But no, I wasn't really, no one in my family is an artist, but they love the art. So I just remember going to shows a lot with my mum. Um, I went to a really good school that we got, we went to like ballet. I did ballet. So I got exposed to a lot of art and my mum would send me to stuff where I did like circus skills and knitting and and we go to the museum and, and I was always encouraged to sing and dance and whatever. So I was encouraged to be arty, even though my family isn't. I think that's like, um, like heartening to hear as like a parent, but also as an educator, because you see things like articles written about how it, important it is to stimulate the child in a whole range of ways. And you're like doing really well for yourself. Like you had um, an amazing show, The Man on the Moon. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so... It's taken me on quite a journey, which has been really lovely. Um, in 2015, I got given a commission from Stun Theatre, who are based in Z Arts in Hume. And essentially Garfield, who runs Stun, was just like, do you want to make another solo show? And I was like, no. <laughs> I thought, all right, go on then. Um, it's just because it's it can be quite daunting, exhausting. It is, it's a lot, but I, I was up for it. And I was like, the only thing that I can imagine writing about right now is my dad, because he's just, he'd been cropping up a lot in my work and in my thoughts. And there was a lot going on in my life with him at the, at the time. So yeah, I was just like, I really want to work with Benji Reed if possible, because I just think he's amazing. And they were managed to sort that out for me, which was just ridiculous. I'll pause you um, there for people who don't know. I'll put a link to some of Benji Reed's work in the chat. Like he used to be like this amazing hip hop dancer and then did loads of stuff around physical theatre. Yeah. And now he's doing these amazing photographs. Of the yeah. And he's like kind of just cool. I've met him, he's like a cool guy. Anyway, sorry, <laughs> keep on going. Keep on going. Yeah. So we just connected and I told him this story about my dad. And he was just like, yeah, this is really interesting. So we just refined it, worked on it for two years. Um, I premiered it in 2017 and then I've just been touring it ever since really and just when lockdown ha happened I was supposed to finish off the, my current tour Um it was going to be quite cyclical actually because it was going to end in Birmingham 
with a lot of my dad's family seeing it because that's where they are and um yeah they've not seen it they knew that it was about my dad's side of the family and all that kind of thing and and whatever so I was like oh this is a nice like significant symbolic way to end the tour but it didn't work out that way but it's fine because I met them through you yeah (laughs) I got to meet them beforehand we met up like a month before and I gave them the book um because I just felt like they needed to so I've got a book Mm. nice Luna poetry but it's also the script of man and the moon in the back as well because I was writing a lot of poetry alongside writing the script so I was like I feel like I need to put a book out as well um what what's the significance of the title like man and the moon and Luna Man on the Moon, yeah. So when I was thinking about my dad and how I viewed him when I was little, I was saying that he felt like an alien to me because he felt very remote, he felt very otherworldly, but also kind of magical. So there's this kind of thing where someone's not like you, but familiar, but you want to know more. Um, So there's a coldness there you feel like you have to travel, learn another language, <laughs> embrace a different atmosphere to understand them kind of thing. So, yeah, all of that was kind of flying around when we were talking. The semantic field felt very much in the space of travel and exploration and space and Afrofuturism. So that title just really landed. But it was one day when I was with Benji in the rehearsal room and he was he knows that I'm a singer. So he was encouraging me to sing and get my loop pedal out and write songs, which I was very resistant to at first. <laughs> um, Why were you resistant? Why did you not want to do that? Because there were two reasons. One of them was that when I'm singing, I feel the most vulnerable. Like I really enjoy singing and I've been part of choirs and stuff since I've been really young. And written songs but never really tried to pursue any kind of career as a singer in the way that I have like as a poet and as a theatre maker um so I just felt really exposed and then the second thing was and this probably feels a bit weird to say but I'm not crazy about musicals and I was just like I don't want the show to be a musical yeah (laughs) Yeah, so it's like, the music work with the words, so it feels me, it feels authentic. Yeah, so it's just like, yeah, (laughs) yeah, and he was like, no, that's not what this will be. But I just feel like when you sing, it lands in a different way. There's a different emotional space, and and I was like, yeah, I agree. I mean, that's why I do a lot of singing with my poetry. I'm not going to deny that I don't sing. I was like, I do sing. I just don't. I've just never done this. So, yeah, he was just kind of pushing me to sing. And there's a song that I love by an artist called Moses Sumney called Man on the Moon. So I, I don't even know how. I think we were just sharing songs that felt relevant. And I shared that one. And then he just kind of made me sing along to it. And then we were just like, this title feels really right, actually, Man on the Moon. It just seems to fit. Um, so that's where that came from. And then for Luna because with the book like I said it's not just um the artist is also called Alison Erica Ford just want to shout her out Uh, and she's great um yeah because the book is not just the play it's poems as well I was like I need to come up with a name that's different to that yeah yeah, just to uh represent that um and yeah I had a lot of chats with the editor for ages it was like moon child this that (laughs) it was like oh it just doesn't feel right and then Luna just kind of landed um I think it's a beautiful name I really like it I think thank you and now I do I think it's a great name how do you feel about doing one of your poems now yeah yeah I can do that (laughs) a little poetry performance between me and you and 400 people watching (laughs) um it's so funny isn't it like I had three picked out but now I'm like oh I feel like reading a different one. That one. <laughs> well that's the nature of the artistic process you kind of been talking about that talking about your work with Benji you think it'll go one direction and then your problem solving brain goes 
you know this would be much better now and then yeah. once you start reading it you might be thinking oh I've not practiced this one <laughs> <laughs> um this one's quite short it's a fib so there are a few things that I was playing around with when I was writing the poems and I wanted to play with form um and I knew about this form called the fib where you follow the Fibonacci sequence for your syllables. And because my dad's like so much into science and mathematics, I wanted to use that kind of language when I was writing the poetry. So throughout the book, there's a series of, of fibs. Um, and I'm sure you found this, that whenever you kind of latch onto a form, all of a sudden you start writing in that form without even knowing it. Yeah. So yeah, it, during this period even when I wasn't writing fibs I found that when I counted my syllables I was like oh <laughs> is that just following that sequence <laughs> I've not heard of this form though so I'm quite excited to hear this now I'm gonna like have a little research of it it's nice to find oh, cool. I mean yeah I think it's probably it might be hard to hear but the way that I represent it visually oh god I don't know if you can see there's too much glare there's too much glare and there's there. a picture and I'll put it in chat when I when it's yeah there. So I put these little like bullet points in between so you can see where the syllables should be. Um, but yeah, I'll send it over. But this is the first fib in the whole collection and it's called Singularity. Um, and I've got the definition written here at the bottom <laughs> to remind me. Uh, and it says, the act of being singular, the mathematical representation of a black hole the point on which a function takes infinite value for anyone who's interested. Uh, okay. Singularity. He is too far ahead. He must go on his own. He says he doesn't like people. I say, am I people? He mumbles something that could be sentimental by the will of interpretation. I could blame his inflamed IQ. Find a label for all of this. Will those facts look after him when he gets sick? Would he burn his books to make a fire or rather freeze to death? Thank you. Um, so just to give a bit more context, the story of Man on the Moon is hinged on a moment when I stopped receiving posts from my dad. And it's I've realised that it's been about six months because he regularly sends me letters and books. Um, that's the kind of crux of our relationship. I've just got loads and loads of books in my house. Um, so I have kind of things that I can attach to him, but books are quite rigid and yeah it's books <laughs> so it's, they're not that lovable um like like earlier when you said about oh um you asked do you want to write another solo show and you're like oh I don't even know like the art of laying yourself vulnerable not just yourself your family and I've experienced this with the stuff I write about and I, I think most people do in poetry yeah. it's a very a personal raw freeing important thing to do mm. so that we like fall in love with other human beings and yeah like thank you for sharing that because it's like really like my little heart's like oh I miss <laughs> you in poetry it's so good no worries and I'm so glad that you said that because that was one of the main things that I grappled with when I started I was like the stuff that I need to process for myself and kind of set those boundaries and know what stuff is like up for grabs to play with and what stuff isn't and checking in with my family a lot and making sure they felt comfortable. Um, because at the end of the day, I was like, I want to play and you want to start with the truth and you want to honour the truth, but I also need to feel like a writer and feel like I'm using my imagination. Yes. So that's why I was like, it needs to feel creative. It needs to feel surreal. Like it needs to, like we need to go to the moon, like all of that <laughs> kind of stuff. <laughs> um so yeah it was really helpful to have this collection actually because the moment there were moments where there was topics that came up or ideas that came up and 
I was like, oh, that's fine. That can go in the book. Yeah. It doesn't have to go in the show. Yeah. yeah. Because when you, when you're creating, you, you, your brain creates what it wants to create, doesn't it? And it, it doesn't always fit. We don't want to throw it away because it's good. It's just not good mm. for that thing. And um, yeah. I'll put the link to the book in the, in, in the um, chat and stuff so people can and buy it and read it and see what you're talking about. I feel yeah. like time's going dead quick. And I wanted to, <laughs> I mean, I wanted to talk to you about um, some of the stuff that you're going to be making because I, when I looked on your website thing, um, it said that you were making a kids show and it said yeah. that you were writing a play with Box of Tricks. So tell me yeah. about one of them. What do you want to tell me about? We can talk about the kids show just because it's a similar world. So it's called Izzy Boss and Fractal. I got approached by Fuel Theatre and Slung Low. Um and yeah, I'm essentially writing a show about a female scientist who travels to the moon. <laughs> right? Yet again. <laughs> artists do that. They draw, like visual artists, they draw the same thing over and over again. I got yeah. these random dogs and rats in all my work. Like, no, <laughs> a rat. Oh, another rat. Okay, come on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, so you're writing about a female scientist that goes to the moon. Cool. Yeah. But it's a completely different slant this time because like we were saying before with that one, with my show, it was metaphorical. Whereas this one, she's actually an environmental scientist and it's a story that's more about the environment protecting it and refuge. So there's an alien and we have to get our young people, our young audience, us, our children to consider if they would bring this alien home if they would save it mm. um yeah so that's the provocation and it's really exciting in that the show is going to live on a vehicle so it's going to travel to schools which is just great creatively but also means that it's going to be really accessible yeah 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 because um, we struggle to get to theatres, don't they? Like, it's yeah. Get theaters, and then if the show comes to them, that's like ace. Yeah, exactly. And what was really nice was this year, despite everything, we still managed to do a little test there with a school. So Slunglow have got a really good relationship with a local school in Leeds and have been going there and doing like bits of storytelling and stuff like that. Because as we know, they're dying for things and, and whatever else with all the restrictions that they've got going on. So we were able to organise it so that one of the sessions was us just reading out the script to them as it is now and just testing it and seeing how the story lands. And that was so gratifying because, you know, there's only so much you can do, isn't there, when you're just sat in your room trying to bash this story out, like, does this work? Does this work? Yeah, uh and children are all different ages and and different kind of experiences so you don't know what's going to land or not and yeah sometimes I think something you're not sure about they love and you're like oh cute yeah that. and then other things you're like oh it's not as good. yeah but was there any moments where you're like oh this is working yeah there were loads that I thought what was really great was the stuff that I'd written in and I didn't realize the kind of physical response that it would get from them so moments where I'm asking them to buckle in or pull a certain kind of face and, and things like that and they do that so willingly and I was like oh that's really interesting or that should be more communal or there needs to be more of that or just those kind of moments so I was just frantically in the corner writing away and then yeah it was just really lovely at the end when we were asking them questions just how much they remembered and how much yeah just yeah. how up for it they were so I was like okay cool <laughs> Oh, um, that's beautiful. So yeah. <laughs> and then, like, um, have you got? A, I was supposed you've not got a piece from that because it's the children's work. Um, what about your bell curve stuff? Is that moving forward yet? Or it is, yeah. So my producers put in the bid in for us to take it to the next stage um, in January. Cool. And I've got an Opera North commission to work on the music in April. Cool. So that should be exciting. So that show is a lot to do with biohacking and the ethics around um, essentially epigenetics and using CRISPR-Cas technology to change our genes and take out parts of ourselves or put things into our DNA. 
that, that's one of the things I really love about you that you're interested in maths and science and how that interrelates to like your artistic work because like it can be a bit of a like a, a little bit of a like oh let's just do some stem stuff like science and technology and math stuff like we'll get some funding for it but like, you know if you're in the some people be like oh I'm not really into it but I'll have a go but yeah. we do. I feel like <laughs> the genuine like interest and in, that's part of your world and it's like a renaissance which renaissance man in it whatever renaissance woman thing in it like interested in all how the world fits together in all its parts yeah yeah I mean I always saw them as being linked when I was little I'm really grateful in that I got introduced to maths and science probably before I got introduced to it quite formally in school so it felt really playful so then when those lessons came along I was like oh I know this and then and then and I was just ready to just get in and it felt all creative to me Whereas I'd look around and some of my peers were just really struggling or just being like, why am I being taught this? This is horrible. I don't understand. And I just felt like it was a shame. So as I've gotten older and gotten into teaching and I trained to be a maths teacher, but I'm, I don't really, I don't behave as a maths teacher. I don't, I don't, I'm not a maths teacher. <laughs> I thought that you did that, but it wasn't 100%. I'm like, sure she's just teach maths at some yeah. point. You just don't do any more. But it's that, you, must have been, you wouldn't have done that, would you not, if you'd not had that kind of love? Yeah, exactly. And I've still got that love and there's projects that I do. I mean, like this, like all of this stuff, like in the st- in the children's show that I wrote, there's a whole section where there's long division, I'm getting the kids to do long division. And oh, like, great sound. <laughs> like, I'm joking, it is a great sound. <laughs> the director was just like, why is this in there? I was like, don't worry, they'll like it. They will. And I was so happy. Like that was a good moment when we were reading it to the kids. Um, yeah the actor was like who here can do long division and about like eight of them put their hands up and I was like yes yes yeah, like, I do like it sure <laughs> let's 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 big up maths I'm a big fan of the maths <laughs> so it's like they oh. do like it they do <laughs> well that's so wonderful if you want to bring it to my school where I've got a resident set we'd sort that out because the head is very small <laughs> and if people are watching they're like I want that show at my parents school write an email to your head we'll try and put you up um okay um so do you want to do us another poem before we start talking about your music yeah yeah um so I'll do another short one actually this one I think because we've just been talking about education and school and stuff I felt like I wanted to share it in solidarity with some of the stuff that happened this year um just the way unfortunately some students were treated by the system so this kind of gets at that but just in a very small way but the piece is called Oysters and it's about this time when I was at college where essentially one of my teachers was really nagging me to apply to Cambridge and I just didn't want to I understood that it was a it was flattering and that it was nice to be told that I had that capacity but I just knew that that world just wasn't for me yeah um And I don't like the idea of when people are kind of like, I don't know, push elitism down your throat as if that's the only route. If you show any kind of like intelligence or talent, that that's the only place that you belong. Yeah. I just don't think that that's true. Anyway, so this is called Oysters. You are in the top 10 percentile of the country. The world is your oyster. I never thought that it wasn't until he stated the obvious. This old boy was trying to tell me something and it wasn't that I deserved to go to Cambridge. Neither was it that I should apply to the girls college because they have a higher ethnic minority population. It was that oysters are expensive, Latin bone gray and not very tasty. Why should I want my world to be an oyster? Nice. Oh, these, these, these short poems are packing a punch. 
<laughs> yeah, and they'll goose bumples. I mean, people don't really want to see my hair yet. I mean, something might do, they might like them. But they, they yeah, are, they are going cool. goose bumply. So, um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I want to read your book now. I've not got your book. I don't really know why. I don't think I knew you had it because I've not seen the show. I'd only seen clips of it because I kept thinking, the show will come. I'll, I'll, book, I'll book a ticket today. I'll book a ticket tomorrow. And I think that's one of the things that lockdown's taught me about prioritising and not doing too much stuff. You know, like when, cramp, when you're at it, there's all these things to go to on different nights. And yeah. You're like, um, yeah, anyway. I know it's not you, but I, I was getting really frustrated. It is, it is a hard balance to strike in that, you know, the more success that you get and the more tour booking that you get, the more you miss out on. So, like, I was out of i was out of manchester so many times and then i was just like oh but this is happening that concert's on and i've missed my friend and this and it's just like and you're like oh what's important what's important like obviously you want to do the gigs and do well and take advantage of the success but yeah there are times when you're like let me just pause and just it's it's a weird life like the act of performing like am i a writer am i a performer do i need to perform my own words can someone else do it for me mm. as well as that's the good thing about kids plays like if someone's acting in it you're like oh you're acting my words here this is the yeah. writing bit not the your own personality behind your own stuff. yeah um let's talk a little bit about um your music stuff Cool. So, um what have you done this year have you had a mini album or something they used to call me yeah Pete. <laughs> yeah so for a year I was working with an artist called uh worker Tom Lear um I admire him very very much I was also approached by a fellow poet and artist Reese Williams um who I used to be in Young Identity with and in a voice and he wants to set up a label where he's encouraging artists who are mainly known as poets and spoken word artists to do something that's like a musical album, like a full-fledged album. Cool. So I was like, yeah, okay, I'll do this project. I'll work on something. So I knew I had this collection of poems that were kind of just floating around. Like, you know, you need a significant number of poems on a certain topic, don't you, to have a collection? And I just didn't with this, but I felt like they had a thread, which was very much about like my female experience and I landed on the title ephemera years ago, actually, because I just got really intrigued by this idea of temporariness and fleetingness and and shifting experiences and just kind of just all that philosophical stuff, isn't it? Like when you like, you know, how are you still the same person if your skin keeps shedding and your thoughts keep changing? And you're like, like, how are you still what's the thing that keeps you? being you what's at the core of you kind of thing yeah um so yeah I just approached um Tom and was like I want to make a piece that feels like it's shifting around you don't know where it's going it's based on all these poems that to do with my female experience are you up for it (laughs) I expected him to be like no (laughs) (laughs) like you're all right love but (laughs) But yeah, he was. So that was really exciting. And it was really nice working with him. Like we challenged each other a lot. And I was like, I really want to reimagine these poems as songs. I do a lot of singing with my poetry, but I really want to push myself. Um, And yeah, it's just been really exciting. And it's the first time that I've done like music videos and all that kind of stuff. And they've had really good responses. And I put the album out and like... I've had DJs from Jazz FM and and Radio Six like playing it and giving me shouts and I was like, oh, this is weird, this is crazy, like I love this. Um, but yeah, so that's been really exciting. Yeah, because poetry, yeah, it's like great. I don't get me wrong, I love it, but it is kind of a bit niche. And even though it's going more mainstream, it's still niche. Whereas music, music's cool. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. can can we listen to one of the singles? Is it called Curse? Yeah. Of the, what's it called? Curse of the Eye. Super. Yeah. We'll, we'll put the music video on now. Cool. Yeah. I'm excited about this. Right, right. Too independent. Too intimidating. Too individual. 
your breath for ransom what is it worth a funny high a chance a cloudy day your dearest love I never said that I knew you were capable of love but I dreamt a warning where I come from women at the table sniff files and get put out reveal everything with pride then die into a thousand pieces. The venom of love, poor and perfect. Prisoners to needs, attempts, blubbering, surpassing beauty. Bless me for destroying him before he found my faithfulness. I pushed my wishes down a hill, after him, panicking, headed into the swamp, lost for doubt. Quiet never kisses nonsense. I am a summer of screams, smothered adventure, singed memory, revenge marauding, surprise quirks fighting, rich from inherited fear. I retire. Lightning has succeeded our future. 
unusual light surrenders, captures us in despair. I swear I cannot save you. Lies do not become us. Oh, wow. So I listened to the track. In fact, I listened to the full EP on Spotify. Um, oh, amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and, but I'd not seen the, um, the video. Uh, I love the video. Like, when I was watching Thank it, I was you. thinking, like, you talked before about Afrofuturism, which some people might have heard of, some people might not. I'll put some links yeah. to stuff in, in the V because I'm, I'm worried that we're going over time. But, um, it's important. And I felt that felt like Afro Mank because like yeah. with the kind of the spinning, you know, like the whole Manchester thing to do with spinning and then we spin tails and like the spinning and the spin star. And yeah. I love the idea of the repetition in it. And the dance was amazing. And it was just good. And I like you having your candy floss microphone at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I know it wasn't a microphone, but right at the end with your little smile. I was like, oh, it's like she's going to sing into it, which she's been speaking into her. I don't know. I just really liked it. Cool. Thank you so much. It's cool. How does it feel watching it like now? It is weird. I do enjoy watching it. It's satisfying. I think because, like you just said, then like I had all these ideas and I really wanted them to land, and I feel like they do. Well, they do for me. Um, yeah, and I just knew I wanted that dancer Emmy in yeah, she's there. Great. I knew I wanted blue, I wanted my hair blue, I wanted this big dress, I wanted the spinning wheel and I got it all, I wanted blue smoke. <laughs> um, when you're talking about it, it, you, it sounds like you're saying furry tale, but when I was watching it, I wasn't feeling furry tale. I, do you know what I mean? I was feeling yeah. like surrealism, but not yeah. necessarily, oh, it's about a princess. I didn't think princess once. For me, exactly. I thought woman, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. I think it's about that. I think it's about coming from that world, but re-interrogating it and finding the actual ground, the gravitas in that world. Like it gets sold to us so much of like as women that we should be ethereal and fairy-like and whatever. And it's like, yeah, we can go for that aesthetic, but it can mean more and it can feel more and it can be gritty and it can be blue and yeah it can feel <laughs> serious and yes yeah, so that and the spinster thing really spoke to me I was reading a book um oh I've forgotten the name of the writer I think he's called Fenton Thomas John no Fenton Johnston yeah Something, and he talks yeah, I'll put it about, in link. I'll put it okay in. yeah I'll send it yeah, yeah it's called it's called it's about like the creative life and how it can be very lonely, but how that is sometimes sold to us as though it's a bad thing, but actually it's not. And to be solitary is fine. And in the book, there's a whole section where he talks about the spinster and how that's kind of been, the the, the term has, has gone through this kind of semantic shift, unfortunately, that's now negative, but it used to just mean a woman who dedicated her life to spinning wool and sewing and making clothes and fabric for the village. Yeah, being her own boss, working for herself. Yeah. <laughs> Clothing people. God, how horrible. <laughs> yeah, and spreading warmth. Yeah, and I was just like, that's cool, man. I was like, yeah, I want to be a spinster. Yeah. That's great, yeah. Oh, well, I tell you what, I feel like you are yeah, kind of amazing. wanting to embrace all of that in the video. Yeah, it, it feels like you, like you really are an amazing artist in this roundish sense, an entrepreneur, and I'm so glad that you're doing well and all these uh, the, the fruits of your brain are beginning to um, come into our lives for our little children and in the music arena. So I just wish you loads of luck. And if you <laughs> like Keisha's work and you want to find out Thank more for the links, buy a book, listen to the stuff on Spotify. You know, if you hear her on the Radio 6, we all listen to the Radio 6, I do too. You could just send them a little tweet, say, wow, I want more. That's what I think anyway. Okay, thank you so much for joining <laughs> me. Thank you. Ah, well, hopefully I'll see you in the real life whenever we can have that. I'm not sure why I'm putting the in front of all these words. I think maybe I'm being quirky. Um, okay, so um, I'll see you soon, Ke Keisha. And thank you so much. Keisha Thompson. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Before I know I spoil my sign off, you have another name for your music. What is it? Like, uh, you have an alter ego? No? Yeah, Shibi Kiki.
GBT. I like that. <laughs> okay, you heard it here first. Well, not. If you're a GBT fan, you heard it loads of times. Okay, okay, I'm saying bye now. Thank okay, bye. you. Thank you, bye. half of January's bad apple um, I've got my Christmas lashes on which you may have noticed or may not I can't remember if I said that in the first half to be honest but it doesn't matter they're that amazing I thought I'd share them with you yes yeah, so if you if male female non-binary get some of these Christmas lashes that's my recommendation okay so I'd like to introduce our second guest oh um, I was still excited about having her on because she's my friend as well as my colleague uh, and I just think she's amazing and I know you will think she is too and then Toria Garbutt she is a poet and educator based over in Yorkshire she's been touring with John Cooper Clark she's been putting a spoken word album out she's got a book she's just sexy and amazing okay well Welcome to the stage, Toria. You may turn your camera on. Woohoo! <laughs> oh, hello. Oh, oh, we're matching. Oh, 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 it's like we planned it. Hello, beautiful. Oh, hello. You're like a little dark green apple. I'm like a Granny Smith. You're like a wild apple. That's, that's me to a T. <laughs> Faz, your eyelashes look beautiful. Thank you. Your face yeah. looks beautiful. Thank you. Thanks very much. I've actually got a little injury on my nose. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, I can they? Um, oh, yeah, I've been like frenzied and frantic today cleaning up and I actually dropped a framed picture on my nose. Happy, happy New Year to all yeah. right? <laughs> Did you glass? No, no glass smashed. So, it's all right. It makes me look like I've had a scrap, which makes me look a bit hard. Let's a look hard. a bit up and have a go if you think you're hard enough. And, and poetry is indeed the, the birthplace of the uh, hard, <laughs> uh, hard people. If you're hard, you get into poetry. Um, exactly. Sorry, why, why, why do you write? What is the purpose of writing and performing in your life? So I watched over Christmas an amazing documentary about Tracy Emin and sort of it sort of reignited my love of Tracy Emin and she reminded me why I write and for the same reason I think that she makes art because I have a need to express myself it's a need it's a need to get all the bits from inside and just put them out um you know and then connect with other people who also feel like that it's just a very kind of like human thing to do I think isn't it yeah um, I, think, I think people like who have not experienced it as sort of like catharsis. Like if you've never done it, people think, well, what's the point of doing it? But then once you start to do it, then I think you feel the benefit, you feel the benefit like a warm coat. Yeah, it's so, it's so good for us. I think like we fear so much, so many of us fear being judged. We think if we say what we really feel, or we talk about those hidden bits of ourselves that we don't ever want anyone to see. We fear that we're going to be judged. And what happens when you write about it in poetry is like the opposite happens. People get closer to you. And that's, that's massively like transformational, you know. Yeah, and your work is very uh, raw and confessional often. I saw um, a Christmas poem you did. I think it was actually advertising the John Cooper Clark book launch. And it was a Christmas poem. And I loved it because it was just so, do you know what? Because it's a bit shit, really. Yeah, you can either cry or laugh, can't you? And I think people who've had a lot of pain, like, laugh the hardest. 
you know, I I think like all the things that happen in my life that might be painful or embarrassing or sad, like get it out, isn't it? Write about it. It's um it's often like the best material, isn't it? Yeah, it's like that dark gallows humour, isn't it? Like, and it's a survivor's humour, really. It's about survival. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, do you want to do us a poem? Yeah, I do. I want to do a poem by somebody else to start with. Is that all right? So you're a rebel. You can do what you want. Well, right. So here it is. Right. So because I've been watching Tracy Emin and thinking about expressionist art, I got googling expressionist poetry. I found a load of expressionist poets from like the early 1900s, but obviously most of them were men coming up. And then I found this woman called Henriette Hardenberg, who's a German Jewish poet from early 1900s. And this is her poem, Hands. Like rare animals, they move up and down and lie deep at the bottom of the sea. Moon coloured is the stone like a wound set in flowering plumage. I fear this hidden motion, like wind held up in branches. So few fingers in figures will excite thoughts in me. The sea divides so that I can reach it in swaying under brush of crystal night. This hand extended flat yet softly sunk there before my pallid face. I don't know whether the little bones rinsed by the sea will drift and mingle or if wrapped in clouds they will reach up for music and dance. I know that dreams without fragrance, like dead fingers rigid in the joints, do not give shrouded magic for which the living call in sleep. Oh, beautiful. I just think that's gorgeous, Faz. I just mm. love it. I just want to experience art that makes me feel. I want to feel what other people are feeling and whether it's in writing or in, in visual art. I like artists that, that express what it is to be human, you know. And that feels like a very kind of escapist, surreal, almost like a disassociation with the world. And like, um, there's something about tapping into your feelings and giving them words that aren't quite real, that is beautiful. You do that really well, Fazzy. That's your thing, isn't it? Entering that kind of ethere ethereal, is that the right word? dreamlike sort of um state in you in your work and sometimes i like to do that just because i feel like I, I like fiction and i'm not writing a lot of fiction i'm writing about largely depressing things haha -ha. um, and <laughs> and i always thought writing a book and having a full fiction is just a bit much um have you been writing anything that's not poetry because you talk yeah. about inspired by visual artists yeah tell me about it yeah so i've written this rough draft of a script it's a one woman show and it's been shortlisted for the silent uproar um writer's support plan um, project so fingers crossed that would I would love that so much if I get that opportunity then they will work with me next, this year to develop it and put it on you know and I'll get to work with like an actor and a director which would be amazing but um I tell you what I've liked about it it's a little bit of me but it's an it's a different character so I've been able to say things that maybe I wouldn't say if it were coming from me or I've been able to I don't know I write a, everything I write is is autobiographical basically so it's been nice to step out of that and write about some imaginary things as well do you know what I mean yeah, yeah sounds so much fun um like I think I saw had you written a monologue for someone and that went on YouTube is it related to that monologue you wrote or is it something yeah else? yeah that's it so it's her so it's that that's the character um so the play is called Kicks and it's basically it's about a woman who is well, she's kicking am I allowed to swear on this because I'm yeah, always really to swear on this one, yeah kicking like fuck to, to keep afloat she's got two kids um single mom and she's kicking and kicking and kicking but then it's also about getting your kicks and those things that we do to try and fill our voids you know of, of loneliness so whether that's like using substances or drinking or sleeping around or all those things really it's just looking at that kicks it's sounding quite cheerful that <laughs> no, yeah, like, oh yeah, and some of that drinking drugs and sleeping around. Yes, please. Been a bit boring this year. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of like characteristically dark, 
but funny as well, I hope. So, yeah, we'll see. It might be. My friend was saying it could end up being like the sort of working class version of Fleabag, and then she said maybe I could call it Scumbag, <laughs> which I thought was a nice idea. Scumbag, oh, Scumslag. There's, a, there's a whole, there's a whole lot of same play. Um, yeah. I mean, we're both in the same sort of boat where we're both like single parents to teenagers, and yeah, the dads are on the scene and they do a bit, you know. But um, being a a working class artist. I don't know how do you feel your motherhood like intersects with your artistic bit. How do the two things work together? Yeah, it's when I left my uh, my kid's dad because uh, my kids have been homeschooled for most of the life, and I was determined to like make a living out of being an artist and keep the kids out of school. So I did find a way of doing it, but it's been pretty barmy to be honest. Like they've, they've been off on tour with me with, with John Cooper Clark. You know, it's like we kind of where I go, they go, and where they go, I go. You know, we're together a lot, and so. Sometimes that's tricky managing it, you know, making sure everybody's needs get met and, and yeah, you know, like making sure there's money coming in, which is not an easy thing, particularly when you're trying to make your living out of being an artist. Um, I, find, I find like there's a lot of doubts about it because like sometimes with the art you're creating, the writing or the performing, you have to overcome your doubts. You have to think, I might think it's a bit, crap but other people seem to like it so I'm just going to do it I might not be certain about sharing this I'm just going to work on it and so like with your creativity you've got to be confident even if you're not feeling confident and then when yeah. you're parenting it's like similar like but with parenting it feels a bit more important like if you're getting it wrong how do you know <sighs> do you know what I remember like when we first were born Eden I remember just wanting everything to be perfect. And then something went wrong after about like an hour or something. And then I've realized since then that like being a mum, it's just all about things going wrong, isn't it? <laughs> you know, and like, and, and embracing it and just like, like not beating yourself up, man. I, I, I really do get a lot of mum guilt and I'm trying really hard this year to, um, yeah, to, to not actually, to not listen to that because doing our best aren't we you know yeah, and we're not far off now the teenagers aren't they so i think we're on, on straight now and then it might be i mean experienced parents who are watching and probably going it's you're not on all straight off when we turn 20 21 you're still worrying but i'm thinking i'm playing the head i mean one of the most powerful things i've seen is when you write about um your children being small and about kind of postnatal depression and about worrying about that and the reactions from the audience the people who come and speak to you afterwards it's just amazing um, it is amazing and you know like I was saying earlier about them them bits of yourself that you hide like I carried so much shame for so long about dropping Eden when he were a baby it was this big dark secret and I felt if anyone found out about it then you know they, they would realize that I am actually a shit mum it's that fear of being found out in it and actually when you tell everybody it takes the power out of it doesn't it and loads of people have gone oh god my I, my baby's fallen from top of the stairs or like you know like we're all I fucking know. up all the time <laughs> we all fuck up all the time and I think as, as women we put so much pressure on ourselves to be perfect mums don't we even when we meet up with other mums we have a tendency to not go, not get vulnerable and actually admit we're really struggling we have this sort of tendency to, to, to put on a front don't we and pretend things are okay so um writing that poem were good for me but also I think like good for other mums as well like I've had so much like positive feedback about that poem so. yeah beautiful you, you also write I remember one, one I've, written, I've read uh, and it's in your book Show us the book, because, you know, people might want to buy it. We're talking about these amazing poems you're writing. Ah, the universe and me. There it is. Ah, it's out with Wrecking Ball, isn't it? Which yeah, is that's right. Good, um, good press. Um, on your bio, you've put you're a poet and an educator. I know one of those poems is related to delivering session in prison. Which, what are your favourite settings to work in? Because, like, as a poet, you get to do all sorts, don't you? Like, nursery through to dementia, museums all sorts really yeah definitely um prisons I love working in prisons and I've been doing some zoom sessions actually like through lockdown um into a prison in Middlesbrough yeah I love it I think especially like going into that sort of environment where it's so kind of you know there's such a sense of disconnect and 
such an authoritarian structure and not much opportunity for like vulnerability and connection. And so I love to go into them spaces and just have these kind of conversations like, like we're having now. We're young lads, it tends to be young lads that I work with and you know, we're talking before about like the, the, the transformative power of words and often like the words that we've been told growing up or the words that we tell ourselves about ourselves is what like entirely shapes our reality. Um, and realising that and recognising it and starting to write about it and realising you've got something to say that's valid and interesting and that, you know, you, you, you are a good person actually fundamentally can, can make a huge difference, you know. And it's, I enjoy seeing that. I enjoy seeing those like light bulb moments. Um, fundamentally, people are good, I think. Oh, that, that's, like, that's quite a philosophy then, isn't it? Fundamentally, people are good. I think so. I mean, there's certain prisoners I won't work with. Do you know what I mean? I, 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 I can't. The, the, the type of lads that I work with that kind of mainly in there for doing, you know what I mean? Drugs and crime and, you know, like it's not a million miles away from... How I, you know where I've grown up and stuff I can see how easily you could take that path mm. um, and I think they deserve another chance those kind of those kind of people you know yeah it's like rehabilitation isn't it not punishment um, yeah exactly that and the skills to live in not normal life which involves being able to express yourself and being able to manage your emotions and if you've not been taught to do that how can you do that and poetry that, is good for that amazing and if all, all you've ever heard is that you you know you're a bad person and that you're not good enough it's where do you start with that do you know what I mean you're only ever going to attract more shit into your life aren't you um do you want to read us another poem do you want to read something from the book yeah. so shall I read so I'm going to read while we we're talking about the mum stuff I'm going to read my good man poem yeah okay so this poem, I wrote it on Eden's 12th birthday and it's about a realisation that I had, um, you know, following like many years of postnatal depression, really. Okay. Eden, today you are 12. Two giant silver balloons, a one and a two suspended like moons. This daft animal song plays by accident instead of happy birthday on YouTube and I just laugh. For once I'm not crushed by imperfection, in fact, I prefer it. Your brother says, cause it's your birthday, you can punch me on arm. And you do. And that birthday buzz is snuffed like a candle, he cries and you're too hard on yourself. You've learned that from me. But this time I don't react. Today, I am older too. Instead, I respond from a place of love, hold space for peace and calm, and like all pain, it passes with forgiveness and acceptance and strong arms. We go out for breakfast, tell tales over toast. This waitress tells me about her son. We talk about all our sons, those ones we mother on behalf of others, she says, I can tell you're a good man. And for the first time, I let it land. I am, I am, I am. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dad. Oh, that's nice. That's a beautiful like um, bit of positivity as well, you know, for like moving forwards in this absolutely rock solid, hardcore shit year. Like, you oh, talk no. about being in the cafe and just having a chat with a stranger and it just enriching your life and we kind of miss we miss that aren't we oh mate honestly last night so at midnight we went down to the park we saw some fireworks going off and like we stood at a distance and had a chat with another family letting fireworks off and it felt amazing to talk and connect with people we need it don't we we need it so much so and have you missed performing yeah, I have missed performing, but I've also kind of, well, one, like, I felt lucky, really, Faz. I feel like, you know, some people have been a lot worse off. I've had, like, a couple of emergency grants from Arts Council. Like, we've been all right, do you know what I mean? So I don't want to complain about not performing because I just think it's kind of a luxury problem. Like, I yeah. have missed it. Not end at world, is it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, if you build the public, you've been thinking, well, well, you know, food on table and... Yeah, 
that's it. Um, but what, what was it like performing with John Cooper Clark? Because you've done that quite a few years. I mean, I always put it on my bio, bio but I only did a month. Like, do you know what I mean? I was just like, uh, oh, someone's ill, I'll come and do a bit. Whereas you've actually can do it. How long have you been doing it for now? Yeah, a few years, you know. It kind of, um, it turned into like a full-time thing at one point, which were amazing, but... Um, like tiring as well and actually it's been quite nice this year to sort of just stop and put some roots down you know the kids are in school now and yeah it's been nice actually it's been nice to stop and reflect but an amazing few years you know what I mean you know you've been a part of it as well it's like it's you can't compare that adrenaline with anything else can you it, it's crazy it's so it's so completely euphoric um, and that, and it, it feels closer to being like a pop star than it does to being a poet. <laughs> you, yeah. you're a poet and you perform, like you might have 20 people in the room, but like when you're on with John Cooper Clark, it's like full rooms, isn't it? It's crazy, honestly. Like, you know, some of the gigs we've done, London Palladium and like Manchester Bridgewater Hall, and that we're talking like 2,000 people, do you know what I mean? And it's mind blowing. It's mind blowing, you know. But what must what goes up must come down, and the downs afterwards are pretty hard as well, you know. It's, it takes a lot from you, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I suppose you can't, you don't think of a lot about the chemical soup you're indulging in, like all those like intense adrenaline and euphoric chemicals, and then after, what you're going to have really? It's a strange thing afterwards. It's a really strange thing. But you know, I won't change it. I, I just love. I love that whole kind of family you know is John, John's uh, sort of touring family you included it's a special thing to be a part of and Johnny Green I, I, you know I love that man with all my heart I miss Johnny Green a lot he's been sending me like um, postcards and stuff through lockdown I started a little collection on a washing line of Johnny Green postcards I've got such a such a lot of respect for him but well, that um, for people who don't know, Johnny Green comes on as tour manager, but in his own right, he's kind of like a punk icon who went touring. Was it with a jam or am I saying the wrong? The Clash. So he, so Clash. he wrote Clash. Yeah, yeah, nearly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on about doing my PhD to do with punk poetry, so I better yeah. kind of learn some of this shit. Like, <laughs> Wait, was it with the, uh, the, the jam? No, please. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> I think that it's testament to you, Tori, that you have these close emotional relationships with the people you work with. I'm not as much like that. I'm a bit more like, this is my professional thing that comes in. Do you know what I mean? Whereas I feel like you're quite a giving person and you do connect yeah I think I do that you know and I think I just I do that with everybody who I meet you know <laughs> I just kind of like I don't know how to do and I don't know how to be any other way it's funny that in there I feel you know people who people who I click with I hold them really close to my heart you know um, I'm also getting good at having my boundaries and keeping out the people who aren't good for me, which I didn't used to be. That you know, that, that were quite problematic and that growing up with that kind of I love everybody and everybody's my friend attitude. Sometimes that's a dangerous thing, isn't it? You <laughs> Did know? you bring on we are? I love you. Come and say, oh, oh I'm, I'm saddled now with us. <laughs> exactly <laughs> that. But um yeah. Yeah, I think we have to be. I think if we're going to have a real human experience, we have to, don't we? We have to be willing to be vulnerable. And, and the thing like, is, when you, talk, when you talk, Tori, it's clear that you're a very um, kind of spiritual person, I would say, even though I, I don't really like that word spiritual. Um, I feel like you, you, do, you are a little philosopher and you do think about things in these bigger pictures and then your work seems so like underclass you know proper gritty no do you know what I mean so I like that contradiction within you as a person and within your writing you know like thinking big things but also coming from a very light yeah I never really thought I never thought about it like that that makes sense because I think I would feel uncomfortable sort of writing about um like so I, I don't know I get a bit cringe over that word spiritual as well but I am I'm, I am spiritual you know like I honestly 100% live my life by like the law of the universe I genuinely feel something bigger out there is guiding me you know and that but I cringe over that word I would hate to yeah I, I wouldn't <laughs> Thought I'd write anything about that, I think. I my know. kids go, Oh, I can't take anyone into that front room of ours. I'm like, Why? Oh, look at the posters you've got up your AP. 
I'm like, I don't think I am an hippie. I don't think you understand what a hippie is. Um, we can't that... afford to be hippies. Hippies were bloody like middle class, weren't they? They had money to be sitting around with the blooming. <laughs> we need make more money, your story. We've got these writing <laughs> talents. We're not poetry's not a money maker. We need funnel it. Get writing yeah. scripts. Do a Netflix yeah, and write yeah. a novel. Maybe that will be a bestseller. Who knows? Maybe we'll get some money. Yeah, there's a lot of money in script writing apparently. So let's see. Oh, you've been fucking amazing at that. Um, what are you, like, this is my final question, then maybe we'll have another poem. Um, okay. Although it feels like it's too short. Um, what are your hopes for this year? Have you got any hopes? Yes, I just, like everybody else, Lou, I want to just see the arts back and theatres back and people out together again just you know living life on a personal level I want to get my second book done and I've had this life coach training I've had a life coach dominant mind mindset coaching on Instagram and she's kind of done this Jedi mind trick where she's told me that I need to set myself a 90 day challenge at the end of which I fail it Ooh. and um and my challenge is to fail at, at right, getting my second book written. And either way, you fail because if you do it, you still fail. And um, I've been writing like more, more than I have for ages since then. So I think there's a good chance that I might get my second book done this year. Um, so yeah, let's see. That's so exciting. I'm really looking forward to the new book coming out. And I re and even if you don't like, I know you said you've been shortlisted for that um, script development opportunity, but even if you don't get that one. I, it'll be such a strong pitch that there'll be other ones so it'll happen yeah, it's just that's it, it. Isn't it? yeah that's it it's a starting point it's been a good kick up ass as well to get something together and get it sent off you know so yeah let's uh, let's see what happens with that book ah. i'm excited faz i feel positive i feel positive about this year yeah i do i think we'll have a nice so i'm not regret saying this but i think we'll have a nice summer i you love to a nice summer and, like, you love a festival, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I do love a festival, and I think like, but just like, I don't know, like learned learned lessons about not too much rushing, not trying to cram too much in, getting a nice balance. I don't know, maybe that's uh, uh, not going to happen, but I'd like that to happen. Um, Tori, can we go out on a poem? Have you got something else you'd like to do for us? Yeah, I have, you know, so me and my sister, we don't talk anymore, but she does watch my videos on YouTube, so I thought sometimes it's a nice opportunity for me to read a poem for her, um, thinking that she might see it. So I had a dream about her um, a couple of weeks back, and then I, wo I woke up and wrote this. So this is called Sisterless. Sister, last night you came to me in my sleep. We were together again like 2003. I'd forgotten that version of us ever existed. We were charity shopping, smoking, doing buy one, get one free. And you know and I know that that means something else to you and me. Singing mouldy peaches, Erna Burner's cups of tea. I said, I'm sorry. And you were sorry too. And we held each other harder than our mum could ever do. And then we slept wrapped in a blanket in a bed, cuddled up like kids on fair beningas again. And in the morning, you had to go, but you wouldn't take me. Said your world was too much, too dark, too soon for me. And I begged and begged and begged for you to stay. But you said you had no choice, no more. And I woke up in my bed in the real world, more sisterless than before. Thank you very much, Baz. Oh, I love that. I mean, I'm saying I feel like your family situation and, and through the poems about your, you know, your your experiences. Um, and I love it. I love the dreamlike quality of it and the and the real day quality of it. It's the sad one to end on, isn't it? But um, well, that's life, isn't it? That's life, lass, isn't it? That's oh, life. And well, I feel like I need to write about it. Sending you a big cuddle, though. Oh, yeah, feeling it, feeling okay. it, Fuzzy. Anyone who's watching, you can have one too. Yeah, come on. All of us together. Come on. Let's, let's wow. hug. Big group hug. Oh. Okay, so that's a nice way to end. And, yeah, uh, that's better. It's always a pleasure hearing your amazing words and thank you for sharing that expressionist poet with us and thinking about Tracy Emin and how we can like get inspired by all the amazing artists in the past, present and future. Okay. Yes. 
Oh, thanks, Tora. I'll thanks, Faz. Thanks for having me. Always yeah. lovely to see your beautiful face. Oh, and you too. And guys who's watching, you can buy a book. I'll put the links in um, the first book. You can buy The Hot Plastic Moon, which was is the um, audio book, I call it. You could call it a CD, you know, kind of the music from Nims and Fugs. Um, and you can see her on the internet. Just put Toria Garber and she'll come up with my beautiful face. Okay. Uh, see you soon. Bye, everyone. Bye, Faz. Bye. If you've enjoyed watching the Old Courts live and you'd like to make a donation to support the work we do, please head over to www.theoldcourts.com forward slash donate. This year has been incredibly difficult for most arts organisations and we're no different, but with a huge effort and support from you and from our funders, we've managed to secure our organisation and the jobs of every staff member. We've also provided 343 artists with paid work for the Old Course Live and our volunteers have delivered over 700 food parcels and made 600 calls to isolated local residents. But the battle isn't over yet. We're currently closed to the public with zero income and we don't know how long this closure is going to last. If you can help by making a donation then you're helping to secure your art centre. We're hoping to be around for a long, long time.